All right, everybody, welcome to 12.4, Probabilities of Compound Events. This section is, we're still talking about probability, but now, instead of just making a single sock draw or a single dice roll, I'm going to make a single dice roll, and I want more than one thing to possibly happen. So, for example, I'm going to roll a die, and I want a four or a six instead of just looking for one thing. And it might sound easy, but it does actually complicate things. To start off with, I have some vocabulary that you need to know. So the first word is union. When I take the union of two things, let's suppose that I have a circle representing event A and I have a circle representing event B. The union of two things includes it all. So everything is included in the set. Here's what I would say. So a union includes everything in event A and B. So if I was going to color in all of the areas I'm looking for, it's everything. So as a comparison, an intersection of, of, of A and B an intersection is only where they overlap. So a union means I'm including all possibilities for both events. Intersection, I'm looking for only where the two overlap. So intersection, only where events A and B overlap. And then there's something else called mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive is something that has no common outcomes. What I mean is, if you are one thing, you cannot be the other. So for example, being a cat and being a dog are mutually exclusive. It is not possible for an animal to be a dog and a cat at the same time. So they are mutually exclusive. They have no common outcomes for what I might be looking at. Keep these vocabulary in mind. For the most part, though, I just wanted you to be aware of it as your textbook, and we are talking about them in class. Mutually exclusive is the one that we're going to really focus on, and that will be on your Chapter 12 test as a vocabulary word. We'll come back to it again as um, our days go on here. All right, so a compound event is when we want more than one thing to happen. So if our two things are mutually exclusive, And I want, I'm going to say I want the probability of A or B to happen. If they are mutually exclusive, which means no common outcomes, to find my probability, I add them together. And I want to just show you an example right away. Look at this, example 1A. You roll a single die. I want the probability of getting a 4 or a 6. The thing is, there is no possible way of rolling a 4 and a 6 at the same time. So these are mutually exclusive, so all I do is add the probability of rolling a 4 plus the probability of rolling a 6, and I get my answer, 1 third. So that is for mutually exclusive, which means they have nothing in common. So you can't roll a 4 and a 6 at the same time. If it is not mutually exclusive, We have a different formula, and sometimes this is so confusing because it's a double negative, not mutually exclusive. So sometimes I say there are, there are common outcomes. You can have both at one time for not mutually exclusive. If it's not mutually exclusive, I have the probability of A or B and that is now equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. Subtract the probability of A and B. So the probability of A plus the prob probability of B subtract the probability of A and B. And this is considered the intersection or the overlapping um, parts of A and B. A good uh, simple example of this is part B in example one. Now I'm rolling the same die. I want to roll an odd or a three right now. Let's say I'm playing a game. I would be happy with an odd or a three. And now 
sometimes you're not you might you might not be sure if there's common outcomes so it could be helpful to list it so my odd numbers on my die would be one three and five and the three on the die would be just three so it does have something in common it's not mutually exclusive so I'm gonna find the probability of odd and three for that part alright so the probability of it being odd is three over six the probability of getting a three is one over six and now see here's the deal I have right now counted I have counted the three two different times so that's why this exists so I have to subtract it off so I have to subtract off what I counted twice and I would agree with you it seems a little silly for an, uh, an example like this because maybe you could have just counted up in your head well there's only three total I'm looking for then but when we get to harder problems it will be worthy to do this subtract off the doubles so we end up with one half example C now I want a probability of even or a three and let's say I wasn't sure if this was going to be mutually exclusive or not you can always just get yourself set up so maybe I would say I want a probability of even plus a probability of three I'm gonna subtract off the probability of uh, even and a three so something that's even and three at the same time and when I was trying to find this okay so there's three evens two four and six there is one three oh there are no even numbers that are also threes there's nothing there so that's just a zero so again you can always get yourself set up if you're not sure and then fill in the probability later if you need to use it three six plus one six ends up being four sixths so my final answer is two thirds look at example two a card is randomly selected from a standard deck of cards remember 52 of them what is the probability that is it is an ace card or a face card? So again, I want the probability of ace plus the probability of face. And if I don't know if there's overlap or not, I will just right away subtract off the probability of ace and face. And hopefully most of you know, actually, we don't need that because you can't have an ace card and a face card are mutually exclusive. You can't have both at once. All right, so probability of an ace, there's four of them. Face cards, there's 12 of them. And again, there is actually no overlap, so that would be subtracting off zero. My final answer then is 1650 seconds, and you do need to reduce your answer every time today. You can put it in decimal form if you want to, but just make sure you round correctly. In fraction form, it would be four thirds. So you might be wondering for face cards, when does it happen that it, it is um, it is not mutually exclusive, meaning there are common outcomes. Look at example B. So now I want the probability of a heart or a face. Again, remember, I'm just making a single card draw. I'm going to draw one card from the standard deck. I want probability of a heart plus probability of face card. And I'm going to subtract off the probability of heart and face at the same time. All right, think about it. Hopefully we've talked about this in class enough that you know. All right, 13 hearts, 12 faces. And now ask yourself, how many heart face cards are there? How many heart face cards are there that we've uh, just counted twice? Well, there's a uh, king of hearts, queen of hearts, jack of hearts. So there's three of them. And I'm doing... You know, I should have said this earlier, but when you add or subtract fractions, remember you only add the, or subtract the top number. So if I wanted to use my calculator, I'd do 13 plus 12 minus 3, which is 22. So 22 over 52, or 11 over 26. Part C, I want to find the probability of a king or a red card. Again, get yourself set up. So a probability of a king plus the probability of red, subtract the probability of king and red at the same time. There are four kings, so four out of 52. There are 26 red cards because diamonds and hearts. And then how many kings are red? So how many things have I just counted twice now? Well, I've counted the king of hearts and the king of diamonds twice. So there are two of them. Subtract that off, add, you end up with 28 over 52, which reduces to 7 thirteenths. 
I would like you to pause right now and try part D on your own. All right, if you're unpausing, the final answer should be 2 thirteenths when I reduce it. And I hope you figure it out, but if I try to do five and a king, there is no card in the deck that is a five and a king at the same time. So I, there was nothing I needed to subtract off that time. So it ended up just being four plus four for my top number. Let's look at example three. And I want to tell you that there's going to be some word problems here that are difficult. So I recommend that every time you do these, you write out the formula so that you know what we're looking for. Here's what example 3a says. Last year, a company paid overtime wages or, or hired temps during nine months. Overtime were paid for seven months and temps people were paid for four months. At the end of the year, an auditor looked at the company records and our question is, what is the probability that the auditor will select a month in which the company paid overtime and temps? So basically, you don't have to draw this picture. We know that overtime was paid for seven months and we know that temps were paid for four months. We want to know what the overlapping period was. What is what is the overlap the that would be the intersection where both happen so in my mind what I'm thinking is what is the probability of overtime plus what is the probability of having a temp worker subtract what's the probability of a overtime and temp worker and then that's going to equal our total time passed So total time passed on the left side. When I look at this, the thing is we're looking for we're looking for when did they pay overtime and temp workers right here. That's what I'm actually looking to find. I don't know that right now. So that we're actually going to say is x. And I still follow my formula, so it's subtract x right there. Then my probability of overtime, and in this situation, it's okay if we don't use a probability. I can just say how many months it happened. So my overtime were paid for seven months of the year, and the temp workers were paid for four months of the year. And that's going to equal the total time passed, and they said that there was nine months total where they were paying temps or overtime people. If I simplify this a little bit, I end up with this. It's an equation I can solve, but I want to tell you that setting it up was not easy, right? That's a thing that takes some practice. So we, we will do several examples on the next page as well. Hopefully by the end you'll feel kind of um, comfortable with it. So I end up with two. So two of the months overlap. And now another thing I can say about these problems are some of you may have been able to figure that two of the months overlap just by looking at the diagram or just thinking about it. If I say two of the months overlap though, I actually have done this a little strangely and I don't yet have a probability. So I'm just going to say, okay, if two of the months overlap, there's 12 months total. So one out of six is the probability that they'll choose either one. When you are ready, flip to the back. Part B, in a poll for juniors, 6 out of 15 took a French class and 11 out of 15 took a math class, 14 out of the 15 took a math class or a French class. What is the probability that a student took both French and math? So in my mind, always go back to our formula I gave you at the very beginning if needed. And the formula was probability of A or B equals probability of A plus probability of B subtract the probability of A and B. You wrote that down on the other side of your paper. Now we're just going to fill in the appropriate things, only instead of A, I'm going to say that is French, and instead of B, I'm going to say that is math. So to start off with, I want the probability of French. Well, that's 6 out of 15. The probability of math class is 11 out of 15 minus the probability of math and French. Well, math and French, that is what we are trying to find. So that's where my variable goes this time. And then we know that 
Notice the wording here. That one is French and math that goes right here. Here they said 14 out of 15 take French or math. So that's this side. So again, read it carefully. Here's my setup. If I simplify a little bit, I end up with 14 fifteenths equals 17 fifteenths minus x. And if I go through and solve it, I end up with my both French and math is 3 fifteenths or 1 fifth. Let's do another one. <laughs> Part C. In a survey of 200 pet owners, 103 owned dogs, 88 owned cats, 12, 25 owned birds, 18 owned reptiles, and we're actually going to use that information for D and E as well. None of the, for part C, none of the respondents owned both a cat and a bird. What is the probability that they owned a cat or a bird? So again, in my head, I'm thinking about my formula. So instead of A and B, this time I have cat and birds. So probability of cat or bird equals probability of cat plus probability of bird minus the probability of cat and bird. Okay, and this time, what is the probability that they owned a cat or a bird? So this part is actually my missing piece this time because that's what my question is. They're asking us for what's the probability they owned a cat or a bird. All right, so let's fill it in. How many, what's the probability of a cat owner? So there's 200 total, 88 own cats, so 88 out of 200. And then what's the probability of a bird owner? Well, 25 own birds out of 200 total. And then what's the probability of cat and bird? And then here's the deal. If it's a, pro a word problem like this, they will always give you all of the required information. So somewhere in this problem, they must have told us the probability of a cat and a bird. And it ends up being in the second sentence. It says, none of the respondents owned a cat and a bird. So it's zero probability because nobody owned a cat and a bird. When I go through and solve that, I end up with 113 over 200, which doesn't reduce. So I can just leave it like that or write it in decimal format. I hope that as you're going along here, you're writing down or thinking about questions you might have that you want to ask me because I know that this, uh, these word problems are not easy. The other stuff you might have found easy, but this other, this, these word problems are not easy. So if you're feeling a little confu confused, write questions, but just know it isn't easy. So pause and rewatch again, and then we'll do more practice in class as well. Look at part D. So same question, let me scroll back up again. Same question, of the respondents, 52 owned both a cat and a dog. What is the probability that a respondent owned a cat or a dog? Okay, so if you read this closely, I'm looking at cats and dogs this time. So probability cat or dog equals probability of cat plus probability of dog subtract probability of cat and dog and then I'll fill in my information. So, um, and again, actually, let me just say, it says, this time again, it's asking for the probability of a cat or a dog, so that's where my X is gonna be this time. All right, cat owners, that was 88 out of the 200. Dog owners, that was 103 out of the 200. And then how many cat and dog owners were there? It tells us right here, there was 52. So 52 out of the 200 owned both. Again, when you add or subtract fractions, only do the top, and I end up with 139 out of 200. I need you to pause the video and try E on your own right now. All right, your final answer should be two two hundredths or one one hundredth. Now, error alert. If you got that wrong, the most common mistake here is putting X in the wrong place. So again, you have to read the problems very carefully and always, and this time, see, they're asking us, they're asking us for and, dog and cat. So that's why I put the X there instead of on the left side this time. Be careful with that. I've got one more thing to show you in this section, and it's about something called a complement. So the deal is, sometimes, instead of counting up everything we want, it's easier to just count up what we don't want and subtract it from one. So for example, if I said, what's the probability of getting a sum greater than or equal to four if I'm 
tossing two dice, if you look at your little dice chart with all the numbers, it's going to take you a while to count up all of them that are greater than or equal to 4. But if I just look at what I don't want and subtract it from 1, it's actually much faster. So that's called the complement. Officially, it is all the outcome. Officially, it's all of the outcomes that are not in the event we're looking for. So all the outcomes that are not in, in an event. And the notation they use for this has a little, it looks like a um, apostrophe symbol. That it's A prime is how you would say that in math language. But that's the symbol for complement. So if you see that on a test or the MCA or something, that is a symbol for complement is the P and then A prime. So to find the complement, I'm going to do 1, subtract my probability of A. So A prime is what I am don't, or what I'm looking for, and A is what I don't want. It's kind of weird because this is what I don't want, and this time I'm looking for the um, a prime. Well, okay, let me do an example and it'll become more clear. So example four, two six-sided dice are tossed. Find the probability of the given event. And so I want the sum not eight. So I want to find the probability of not eight. So not an eight would be a prime. So I'm going to do one subtract my probability of an eight. And I didn't say this, but I want the sum right now. So one minus a probability of a sum of eight. And I subtract from 1 because that would be 100%. And my probabilities never exceed 100% for an event. Look at this. If I go through my little dice chart, try it if you want, pause and try it. How many have a sum of 8? If you go through and count, there's 5 of them. Well, that was way faster than counting how many weren't 8. So just 1 subtract 536. And here's where... You can use your calculator if you need to, but just think of think of 1. 1 is really 36, 36, right? If I try to find a common denominator. So 31, 36 is my final answer for that one. Here's another one, part B. Now the sum is greater than or equal to 4. So what I'm going to do in order to figure this out, I'm going to, um, if I won't, and this time, this time, I was, okay, pause, let me start over. A, for A, I was specifically looking for not 8, and this time I'm looking for greater than or equal to 4, so I am going to take the complement by doing the opposite. So I want to find a sum less than 4, and I'll subtract the not, that off. So I'm looking for what I don't want, and putting it right there, and subtracting from 1 to find what I want. Hmm. So how many have a sum less than 4 is the question. There's only 3 of them. 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1. So again, think 36 over 36. So 33 36 are um, less or greater than or equal to 4. So that would be 11 twelfths for my final answer. We got two more. A card is randomly selected from a standard deck of cards. Find the probability of the given event. So first we're going to try like example A. I want the probability of a not king. So I don't want kings, so I'm going to do one subtract the probability of finding a king. And there are four kings in the deck. Think of one like 52 50 seconds. And then I subtract off the four 50 seconds, so I get 48. 50 seconds or 12 thirteenths. And last but not least, part D. The card is not an ace or a jack. So I want probability not ace, not jack. Again, I'm going to do one subtract the probability of ace or jack. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, there are four aces and there are four jacks. So that's eight cards. Think 52 subtract eight because it's 52 over 52 for 1. I end up with 11 thirteenths for my answer. Nice job for listening, everybody. Make sure you write down your questions and you mark ones that we might want to talk over in class. Thank you.